Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so, um, this is, as Scarlett says, a, a talk about general strategic uh, thinking. Um, and uh, I'm going to, um, I think I want to say at the start is, uh, by all means, please you know, speak up and ask questions during the talk. I also am um, going to set some homework um, at the end. Um, and I reckon I need about 10 minutes to set the homework and maybe take questions. So if I haven't got into the homework slide by 10 to, uh, 10 to 12, you know, Scarlett, please remind me or anyone else shout out. Ask for the homework. Where's the homework, Andy? Um, okay, so strategic thinking for researchers. Um, so there's, you're at the start of this school, and uh, there's, there's going to be a bunch of talks about actual research content later in the day and, and during the school. And on Friday, I know that Simon PJ, is, is a, who is a great speaker and researcher, is going to give some talks specifically about how to write uh, a research paper and then how to uh, you know, give a talk about uh, a research paper. So I'm sort of assuming that you, you could do this already, or you're learning, how, of course, you're learning how to do this anyway, um, and you'll, you'll get Simon's talk at the end. So I'm not going to speak about those sort of um, specifics. I'm speaking more about longer term things, I mean, about how um, researchers, I mean, us, how, about how us researchers, how us researchers choose problems um, and try to solve them and take them further to get people to, to pick up on. Uh, the, the ideas um, that we've got. Um, so if, uh, you know, research is your life, I mean, I think every, everyone in this room, you're, you're dedicated to, we're all dedicated to research. You know, we probably work night and day on, on research. We're going to devote that much effort to it in the long run. Um, you know, it's, it's important to learn execution, i.e. how to um, write individual papers and so forth, but also think longer term about um, strategic questions or you know over the five year ten year the whole your whole career these kinds of things so this talk uh, there's nothing particularly original about it this is a compendium of ideas that I've got from, from various sources uh, and I've given this talk a few times now and every time I do it I feel I learn a little bit more myself so I, I, I'm giving this talk for selfish reasons <laughs> that it helps me think about the strategy and therefore I hope it will help you as well and I mean some of this is going to apply to you today as grad students and I think some of it hopefully will give you insights into what it's like to be a full-time researcher, maybe as a postdoc or, or, a, uh, uh, or as a lecturer or as a professor or, say, a researcher in a corporate lab like, like Microsoft. Um, and I, I, I always feel I'm, I'm kind of stepping out of my comfort zone when I give this talk because it is like a, a set of heuristics um, and they're probably a little bit contradictory. Um, and I, I, I'm not sort of backing this up with rigorous theory or empirical evaluations or user studies or, or anything like that. Um, and, and, and indeed, there's not one particular correct strategy, um, but I think there's some common points. And I don't even say that uh, I or anyone else follows all this advice all the time, but I think people, I think successful people follow at least some of this advice some of the time. Um, and personally, why am I doing this? Well, I don't know, it's a sideline. I've, I've got interested in uh, uh, the, the general question of, of strategy for researchers and getting researchers to talk to one another. So a few years ago, uh, with a colleague called uh, Tora Grapel, who's a machine learning researcher in this lab. So, it's, I mean, I'm a programming language researcher, so he's like, you know, on the other side of the lab, technically from me. We decided to get together and think about impact, I mean, beyond individual papers. And we had a workshop here at Cambridge in the lab for Microsoft researchers, uh, you know, talking about uh, long-term uh, impact. And it was, frankly, a huge amount of fun just talking about it. And so here was our goal, to gather our community together to ask how to have impact through research. And we, we held it over an afternoon. And it was, we had a series of speakers. Um, and it was, um, it was a sort of, there was a time out to make us stop and think about how our work can change the world and get folk talking about it um, and to generate tips. So I basically condensed uh, some of that material into this, into this hour in the hope that it's, it's more generally useful. And it was a whole lot of fun. So we did another thing. The MSR Speed Dating Society um, so this was a research speed dating society, I should emphasize. Um, but the idea was to create serendipities, to create connections between different research areas and just sort of randomly mix people up and get them to talk to one another. Because um, I think, I mean, a, ge a general problem uh, that we have in, I mean, any academic subject and certainly in computer science is that, you know, it's, it, you know they're, they're big and there's many threads of work and people get specialized and the conferences that you go to are different from the conferences that 
colleagues in your department might go to. Um, and we tend to fall into silos. And we think it's really important to get out of those silos and uh, learn what other problems are going on. Because who knows, you might come up with an idea that could solve them. So we wanted to get people talking. So we had this speed dating society. Uh, and this was, it was really quite light. There wasn't much theory. We just got people together uh, in the room. And there's some pictures from the day to try and create some social links. Because even in our lab, I mean, there's, I guess there's about 100 researchers, we have this problem of silos. So we try to get people to talk to one another. Um, and, and, and eventually, we thought this might lead to, to transfer of expertise and collaborations. But the immediate plan was just to get folks talking to one another. So everyone had a few minutes to speak uh, about uh, something surprising about them, themselves as a kind of icebreaker. And then we set up speed dating, just like you might do if you're trying to find a romantic partner. We, here, we're trying to find research partners. We just had like a three minutes, I think people had, or three minutes or five minutes, yeah, these, these speed dates. Um, and it was great fun. And we had some mixed reactions, though. Uh, one of our visitors said to me, I'd love to come, Andy, but I'm a happily married man. <laughs> so he kind of missed the point a little. Uh, <laughs> and then we had a morning after survey, um, and, uh, which was basically quite positive. You know, I think 60% or 75% thought, you know, gave the, gave the, uh, the thing uh, uh, at least four or five out of five. So that was great. And most, people's, most people learned something surprising, and they all wanted us to organize another. So that was a, a success. In fact, we should organize another because it's been a couple of years. So that's a bit of background. But let me get down to uh, some of the stuff that, that came out uh, in, in those discussions. So the, the, I think the most important thing, I mean, if you remember nothing else, know what you're trying to do. Uh, that is really key to success in, in research. Here's some quotes. There's Bjarne Strusserup, of course, the inventor of C++. The most, signal, the most important single aspect of software development is to be clear about what you're trying to build. On the right, that's Werner von Braun, a bona fide rocket scientist. Uh, he was a German rocket scientist uh, during the Second World War and uh, you know, uh, uh, developed a lot of uh, rocket technology there and subsequently moved to the USA. So a real rocket scientist. He says, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, you, you maybe don't know what you are actually doing, but you should at least know what you're trying to do. There should be some sort of objective insight that you can explain to people uh, in, in, uh, in a short time. Uh, and then what you're doing today is moving towards that. That's super important rather than just, I mean, serendipity uh, is, uh, does exist, but, it's, I'm, but you shouldn't rely entirely on serendipity. A job interview question. Part one is, what is the most important uh, uh, problem in your field? I've actually interviewed and been asked this question, and you can always come up with an answer. You think, well, what are the important, what are, what are the important thing other people are doing? And then the question is, what are you working on? You know, if you can identify something in your research area that's the most important thing, maybe you should be working on that. You know, if you're currently working on something else, maybe you should drift towards doing that. So Pasteur had this uh, saying that uh, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, and I guess the point there is that ser you know, serendipity is where you sort of have, you know, just by chance somehow uh, you know, come up with something that is useful in some area that you weren't thinking about. Now, that definitely happens. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there's Pasteur, who was a hugely successful scientist, indicating that you, know, you, can rely, you shouldn't rely on chance. You should prepare yourself, have a, have a you know, particular uh, end in mind. Um, you've got to work on important problems. I mean, this is maybe another way of saying the same thing. This is Richard Hamming. Uh, and he has an excellent essay uh, about you and your research that you can get on the web. I mean, it's written in a slightly macho sort of 60s style, I would say. Uh, so. You know, there's some aspects of it I find a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but still, he, uh, he sets out uh, a lot of principles they had. So he was a leader at Bell Labs and, and did a lot of work on, on coding theory back then. Um, and uh, he, he was saying, so he had his sort of Friday, Friday afternoon thing that he would spend 10% of his time trying to understand what were the big problems in his field. Yes, he systematically did that every week. We spent Friday afternoons thinking about what the big problems were. Um, and then over time, he'd say, well, if I really believe the action is over there, why am I going this other direction? And he would actually you know, switch over to, to work on, on the more important problems. So I guess he's saying there, you can't do this overnight. You, know, you might realize today this is a really important problem. I've been to a conference. It's a hugely important problem someone is starting to work on. So you can't necessarily change overnight, but it's something you can sort of move towards um, over time. Um, so the corollary is don't work on unimportant problems. So you've got to think to yourself, what am I currently working on? Is it important or not? Now, uh, I've often myself been opportunistic where I've kind of thought of an idea or there was a little connection I could make and written a paper about that and published that. And sometimes that's worked out and other people have 
you know, picked up on it. Other times it's been a sort of dead paper that has really, you know, gone nowhere. So I kind of believe in being opportunistic, where you kind of, you know, sort of bottom up, kind of put something together. Um, but I'd say, you know, don't get carried away. Don't do what they would call a peanut butter strategy, where you, it's a sort of thin layer of investment over, ev over everything, where you try and do a little bit of everything. You, you need to be a bit focused on, you know, working towards important things. All right. So there's, there's actually, uh, there's books you can read that uh, kind of review creativity, review, you know, where great innovations come from. And one that I'd highly recommend is this by Stephen Johnson called Where Good Ideas Come From. Uh, and he's got a nice TED talk. And I'm, I guess this deck will be on the web at some point. And I've got a URL for his TED talk. And he's got a great review of different styles of invention, um, but just looking back over history uh, and the, the kind of strategies people have followed. Uh, so it's not exactly a how-to book, but I think it's a really good background reading for you know, how you organize yourself uh, in order to be creative uh, in, a, in a PhD. So one of his points is that big new ideas you know, very often result from recycling and combining ideas rather than the sort of Archimedes in the bath having a eureka moment uh, and just on their own figuring something out. So consider this range of, so he, of, of different kinds of inventions. So we're going back a bit. So double entry bookkeeping, right? Which is a kind of technology if you think about it. Um, and it had a huge impact. So double uh, entry bookkeeping uh, is, uh, is the idea that uh, every financial event gets recorded twice in two ledgers, one for debit and credit, and then you balance them out to make sure that there's been no sort of funny business. Um, and this really revolutionized, you know, commerce and trade um, and, you know, allowed sort of companies to flourish and build up and you know, established financial trust, uh, you know, in one another. Um, and that, that was not a eureka, eureka moment. That was really a collective effort. It seems that if you go back and look at the history, there's, there's, no, there's one person who codified it, Luca Pacioli. Um, but it seems that it, the idea had been used you know, many times. It sort of arose and was sort of developed by you know, many people. So it's a collective effort. And on the other hand, uh, something like uh, the invention of the printing press was, was one guy, Johann Gutenberg. But it was very much combinatorial. Uh, so he, he pulled together four things for, uh, to, to make the printing press. There was uh, movable type that you're seeing there. Where are we? You know, movable type that you can uh, sort of assemble to make a page and then sort of disassemble. Uh, and then there's the actual press. And then there's ink and there's paper. Now, all of these had sort of were around and had existed before. And he was the one that brought them together. And he wasn't even the first to come up with the idea of movable type. That idea rose in China some centuries earlier. Um, but the Chinese at the time didn't have anything like a, a press. I mean, this. Gutenberg used a wine press, um, and they, the Chinese didn't have that, so they weren't able to kind of make this, this combination. So this is really, uh, according to Johnson, he gives lots of examples. This is a very typical kind of invention, where you take a bunch of ideas that already exist and bring them together. And you could probably, if you go and look at research papers, you'll see this is very common, in fact. You know, someone will come up with an idea, so off the topic, something like, um, well, uh, say separation logic in, in the areas of program verification. That was a particular idea that Peter Rohern and, um, and John Reynolds came up with. Uh, and they, they, they applied it in one particular area. And then there's a lot of papers that have developed that, that took the idea of separation logic and then added in, say, maybe we'll apply it to functional languages, or we we'll apply it to concurrency, or we we'll combine it with, a, with a, a different kind of theorem prover, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of sort of combinations happen. And this is the typical way in which you know, uh, creativity happens. And it's typically. Uh, you know, done by a whole lot of people. On the other hand, the Eureka moment does happen. So this is, uh, what's his name, David Collier, uh, Carrier, sorry, David Carrier. So he's the invention of the air conditioner. Uh, now this had huge impact. This was in 1905, he invented the, you know, air conditioning. Um, and this really, uh, 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 this really changed the face of America. Before they had air conditioning, nobody lived in Florida, nobody lived in the Midwest, roughly speaking. You know, it was impractical to live in great parts but once they had air conditioning, it really changed things. There was great migrations, and it really buffed, beefed up the economy and so forth. Um, and you know, it's had impact right across the world in, in the tropics. Um, and he really just thought it up, uh, apparently. You know, he was just one day kind of observing some fog somewhere. And this, he kind of put two and two together and figured out how to make sort of artificial fog, which led to uh, his air conditioner. So I'm putting that up. This does happen. It still does happen occasionally. But far more often, it's combinations that uh, are, are where innovation comes from. Now, uh, another uh, idea is, is from uh, the guy Stuart Kaufman. And uh, 
Johnson really develops this. This is idea of the adjacent possible. So it's a way of talking about what is immediately possible, given the sort of the materials in the room. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of creativity is that you can't go, uh, you know, from uh, you couldn't go say, you know, in zero AD to produce a printing press because the materials just weren't available. We didn't know how to have, we didn't have wine presses, we perhaps didn't have paper, didn't have ink, and so forth. But by the time Gutenberg came along, it was possible to put those things together. And then once you got printed books, that enables a whole lot of other things on top of that. So the adjacent possible is kind of describing the, the sort of the shadow future, what's sort of hovering on the edge of possibility, what the autocomplete would give you in some sort of sense, uh, the way in which the, the present can reinvent itself. And I'd recommend Johnson's book because he steps through uh, sort of six different ways in which uh, creativity can, can lead to uh, taking the adjacent possible further. So one of his points is liquid networks, uh, he calls them. And this is just the idea that people are, have meeting places where they physically get together, initially anyway, like in a coffee house, you know, several hundred years ago, people would get together and talk about ideas and come up with new ones. Uh, and before coffee houses, this, is, this didn't happen so much. That really accelerated, and generally cities Cities themselves just have lots of ways in which people meet, work, and play, uh, and, and really uh, they, uh, they, they create an awful lot of innovation. And now the inter internet does the same thing. Uh, the slow hunch. So again, this is, um, this, is getting a, this is evidence away from the idea of the eureka moment. So Darwin, and, and we, we kind of fool ourselves, actually. Uh, so Darwin has a date, uh, September 28, 1838, when he in his autobiography, he says he thought up natural selection, uh, in his theory of evolution. People have gone back and looked at what actually happened, looked at his diaries over that period. And there's really no evidence of this at all in his actual diaries. The best we can say is that he, he was starting to think about it the previous year, summer 1837. And by the time of November 1838, he was proclaiming that I have this new theory and writing his book about it. Um, and the, 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 they look at his diary entry for the day where he thought about it. Um, and he kind of notes down, he actually does, uh, does write down in his diary something that would be a, a definite statement of natural selection. But it's not as if the next day he's suddenly out trying to tell people he's gone on to something completely different in his, in his diaries. He's like, totally calm about it. So it's the idea that you've got a slow hunch that there's a connection to be made. Uh, you know, in his case, that uh, the sort of diversity from uh, sort of random mutations with the environment would, you know, would affect reproducibility and hence would lead towards uh, you know, different species, different in fitness and so forth. You have, you, uh, I mean, you can get to that idea, but uh, before that, you maybe have a hunch that some kind of connection, some sort of explanation. Um, and it kind of it evolves over time. Um, and maybe eventually there's a point where, you, where it crystallizes. But, but often, it doesn't actually happen in one particular moment. I mean, this definitely happens to me uh, in papers. OK. Serendipity, we've heard a little bit about that. There's lots of examples. LSD, LSD was invented, and five years later, the guy accidentally ingested it. You know, they were using it for something else, and then he kind of got this psychedelic thing. So they went, oh, okay, there's this other application. Teflon, we all know about. <laughs> Viagra was invented originally for heart trouble, but then in clinical trials, they discovered it had another application. Um, error, oh, this is fabulous. Uh, that we shouldn't be scared of error. You know, things go wrong, but very often we can learn from errors. Uh, Lee DeForest is this guy here, and he invented uh, the Audion, which was the first uh, sort of electrical amplifier that could amplify a signal, and hence led to all sorts of technologies in the uh, early uh, 20th century. Um, and he invented this, and it worked. But he, he thought it worked. His, his original Audion actually had a gas inside it. Um, and he thought, I mean, so it actually works through electromagnetism, but he thought it worked by the gas becoming ionized, a sort of uh, sort of chemical process, I suppose, maybe not chemical, uh, physical process, but not, not, not ele electromagnetic as such, not just a wave. Uh, and, and so he was completely wrong about how it worked, but yeah, he still managed to get something to work. He was tinkering, came up with this thing that worked, and then ran with it and made a lot of money. And he's quite a character. He had, uh, uh, he had four wives, uh, he had many companies, people accused him of fraud, he was convicted of fraud. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd... Uh, I'd commend to you kind of learning from your mistakes and not being too scared if you make errors. But I mean, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily suggest you, you're so, that your, your personal lives follow you know, his, uh, his style. And he also, uh, he's actually, a, uh, 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 he's actually a, 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 he's an ancestor of uh, Bones from, uh, uh, from Star Trek. Um, so I think he's probably, he'd probably be, be, 
be happy to remember it for his, for his, um, for his diode uh, than for, for Star Trek. Okay, acceptation, going back to different ways of uh, creativity. Acceptation is just the idea that something invented for one purpose can be applied for another. Um, so birds, feathers for birds were there originally for warmth and for regulating their body temperature, and later on they, they turned out to be useful for, for flight, and that applies to lots of things. Uh, platforms, um, so this is the idea that uh, once you've got some innovation, uh, it allows someone else to build on top of it. And I think we're very familiar with this in software, uh, that once you've got a, an operating system, you can do th more things with a computer than you could if you're working on the bare metal. If you have a programming language, you can do more things than, than if you just started from scratch. So it's the idea that you can build on top of other people's innovations. And we see this a lot in computer science. You know, and it's well worth knowing what sort of platforms are out there in other areas. You know, there's amazing tools that can do automatic natural language processing that could be applied in a completely different area or theorem proving that could be applied in a different area. So that's another reason to, to know what else is going on so that you can sort of lift an idea and move it to a, to a different place. Okay, so I, I recommend his book. I'm not gonna go through all these, but he's got all these tactics he describes, the things you might do to kind of just, you know, uh, just, just kind of stir up your creativity. And a lot of them are about, let me see, about making connections. Uh, like writing, th writing everything down, but keep your, your, your folders messy so that you have to look for things and then you kind of are reminded of other ideas you had. I, you just occasionally that sort of stirs things up and you will come up with a great idea. Uh, whoops, a daisy. Uh, okay, so I highly recommend his book. Let me, let me change tack from a sort of theory of, of creativity to what it's like to be a researcher in a lab like Microsoft uh, Cambridge. So this is Don Syme, who's one of our heroes in uh, this lab. He also was an early employee, he started in 98. Uh, and his big achievement, uh, or two big achievements so far, were, were to, uh, let me see, to get, to do amazing tech transfers, and in particular, he did .NET generics uh, about 10 years ago, and that was adding you know, polymorphic types, generic types to the .NET platform. I mean, when it first launched, it, it had no uh, parametrics, and he was the guy who kind of had the vision to implement it, sort of in a sort of skunk works thing on the side, you know, separate from the, the product group guys, and then persuade them to adopt it. And then he also did this programming language, F Sharp, uh, which has become a product now uh, since, uh, uh, I don't know, 2010 or so. Um, and so th these are, so this is actually a slide that, that he wrote for our impact workshop. And so he, here, he, you know, on this slide, he's like, he's kind of directly addressing like corporate researchers, the kind of activity, you know, the way that you, you should behave, you're trying to make an impact in a company like Microsoft. And I think this applies to Microsoft, but it also applies, say, if you're working in a university and you want to make an impact with a startup company, or if you want to you know, be a consultant in a larger organization. Um, so deep trust and dedication. So he really had to sort of basically devote himself to this and not write other papers, really spend all his time working on the, on the product and interacting with the product group. Uh, important to show respect. So it's no good going into a, a company with your PhD and talking fancy language about, you know, type theory or, you know, using fancy academic language because that tends to alienate people in a product group who don't have PhDs. Probably come straight from their straight from university and they've built up a reputation as good programmers. And I'm afraid, for better or worse, those folks often uh, they have respect, but sometimes suspicion of people uh, with, you know, with PhDs. So, so with us in MSR, we've got to be very careful when we address product groups to you know, sp you know, speak specifically and not, not sort of theorize and, and speak as if you're you know, in an academic seminar. Uh, his advice is to actually look at real problems that the product group groups might face uh, and try and find ways to fix them uh, and, and basically do research uh, you know, on the, you know, the systems that are actually being used at the base. Get your hands dirty. Uh, you, I mean, the, the, there are plenty of industry problems that are real. I mean, sometimes they're not immediately publishable as papers if you find solutions. Uh, but it, it can be can be worth solving. You know, some uh, uh, some some real problems that they have uh, in order to establish credibility. Um, and tactically, uh, inside you know an industry or inside a company, there's often the leaders are proclaiming a particular strategy that the whole company might follow. And in the case of Don. Back in 2000, uh, Gates and Co. were proclaiming that we should go for .NET. We should have a, have a sort of managed runtime. It was obviously in competition with Java at the time to have a sort of managed, you know, garbage collected runtime uh, and you know build a stable platform on top of that that was highly usable. So he very much aligned himself with that vision that came from the high ups. 
But at the same time, you can't go in just you know, uh, relying on that. You've got to establish trust with people uh, in the actual group. Um, so he highly advocates this as a, uh, as a fun, <laughs> although frankly risky uh, experience. It doesn't always work out. Um, now, I want to uh, again shift tack and talk about... Oh, okay. Um, so that's oh, scum works. Is just the idea that you can have a project where there's uh, that's sort of not known to the management, if you like. So uh, you know, we're done. So there was a product team over in Redmond that were doing .NET 1.0, and management and so on decided they would have a particular design that was very similar to the original Java and didn't have parametrics in it. And so Don, without really asking for permission from anyone and not really alerting management would go in and basically add generics to it, and then basically present a running demoable system. Say, look, you could do this. Uh, you know, he hadn't slowed anybody down, hadn't ruffled management, getting into, you know, mess with folks in any way. He just presented a possibility, and, after, and over time, they accepted it, and it, by version two or three, they, they, they had the generics in. So that's the kind of idea where you have a project that's sort of insulated from, uh, well, I guess insulated from management in two ways. One way in that management over in the product group didn't know about it, and the other way is that in some sense management here didn't know about it because management here generally doesn't care what we do so long as we do something cool. Uh, so the whole, and in some sense, the whole of MSR is a Skunk Works project. I'm maybe slightly exaggerating there, uh, where uh, they say go do something interesting and come back next year, uh, which is you know great fun, great responsibility, also demanding. Um, okay. <laughs> well, please ask more questions if I've not been very clear. Right, so here's, uh, uh, here's a checklist. Uh, so this is a checklist that's used at the DARPA, you know, the, the American uh, uh, sort of defense uh, research agency. Um, and they use this to assess projects that they're going to fund or not. Um, and I'm going to make a connection between this and Don Simon's work. Um, but I find this a great list of uh, questions to ask about a sort of medium-sized research project uh, to, uh, to ask and to answer. Um, Hallemeyer himself is awesome. Uh, he was the guy who invented the liquid crystal display. Now think about that, the LCD, the impact that has had. I mean, he was doing that back in the 60s, you know, and today, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, 50 LCD displays or maybe 100 in this room, you know, you know huge impact. Uh, so he's an electrical engineer, and uh, these are the questions. What are you trying to do? Who cares? If you're successful, what difference would it make? And, and what are the sort of midterm and final exams uh, to check? So let's go through these just to, to give an example in the question. In, and I'd use Don's work um, as an example. But you could also try this at home, like think about your own PhD or think about maybe a research program that excites you in your area and try answering these questions for that research program just to give you a feel for, uh, well, how to, how to use the catechism. And they still, I, I, I've been involved with DARPA recently on evaluating some projects, and I've discovered they use exactly the same questions or slight variations. And uh, they, they very much, you know, recant or uh, sorry, recite the uh, Hallmark Catechism where they consider projects. But let's think about Don's project. So what are you trying to do? Articulate your objectives using absolutely no jargon. Well, my, this is, oh, by the way, this is my stab at it. I didn't ask Don. So what he was trying to do was allow the benefits of tight functional programming on the .NET uh, platform. Because beforehand, you, you could have a Java-like language, but you couldn't use functional programming. Now, you might say there's a little bit of jargon there, and I'm probably guilty, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Um, how is it done today? So you always should compare your research idea with what the current practice is. And at the time, c 10 had no generics, and we knew generics were a big advantage. It had no functions, ditto, and it didn't have type inference, ditto. So the, the baseline he was working with had a lot of disadvantages compared with uh, what he was going to deliver, and so did the competition like Java. They didn't have, didn't have these things either. So what he was going to do was a clear advance over current practice. What's new, and why do you think it'd be successful? Well, the new thing would be, you could say, that relative to the C-sharp language, it was a simpler and more succinct syntax. And why do you think it would be successful? So this question is like trying to get at, do you think this is actually going to work? Or is what you're proposing you know, way beyond the adjacent possible, and you just can't do it? Um, and there was plenty of evidence that it would be possible because there'd been, you know, 15, 20 years of typed functional languages in other settings. So it was fairly clear that that would happen. And also the, the, the underlying common language runtime, the CLR, that he was building on was designed to support multiple languages. So, it, you know, it should be possible. Um, and who would care? 
<laughs> Another question, you know, you may come up with this great thing that goes beyond practice, but is there actually an audience or are there customers? Um, and that was unclear, to be honest, because I think back in the year 2000, um, there wasn't a great number of people using functional languages for real. So that was a, a, a place where, um, where um, there maybe was some doubt. But he was pretty shrewd, and he figured that there was a segment, there was a population of users in the financial community who were sufficiently sort of technical and mathematical to, to like writing succinct programs in, in, uh, in functional languages like Haskell or, or OCaml um, or other dialects of ML, and that they would be a good target for, for F Sharp and for, um, for generics. And whereas he was, I think he was aware pretty early on that the, the original audience for C Sharp, which is folks building websites, were probably not going to be that interested. You know, he's probably probably too sophisticated, didn't, didn't give man, many benefits. So that meant when he was always when he was presenting these language, you know, these language features, he was always careful to target, make, make clear that he was targeting a particular population of fairly technical um, users. What difference will it make if you're successful? Well, uh, this is the kind of argument he'd make inside Microsoft that it's, that, you know, it's going to lock in uh, users in financial and technical institutions of various sorts and make them more, well, locked into .NET, which is what software companies try and do. Um, what are the risks and payoffs? Um, well, I mean, there were several. Uh, one would be there was no support from the product groups. It wasn't on their agenda, so they weren't going to help him. At the same time, they didn't really hinder him. Uh, and a payoff would be that, that he could transfer various research ideas, so various other things that units of measure you know, like having the type system know about kilograms and meters per second, that sort of stuff, uh, and type check that. That was a research idea that eventually was transferred because you could make F sharp work. So that was a, an additional payoff that was, I guess, unexpected. Um, so going back to risks, another risk is the product groups could actively take advantage of him uh, because they were, uh, in some sense, you know, the product group doing the CLR uh, was his only possible customer. And when when you know you're the only customer of someone, you've got great leverage over them because they can't go anywhere else. Don couldn't go into Sun and say, oh, look, I know how to do generics. That would be kind of bad for MSR to uh, you know, make, make uh, Java better. So all he could do was put generics into the CLR. So what that meant was they, they tended to um, offload work onto Don. So he did, had to do a lot of stuff single-handed. But he's a bit of a code god, so that worked out. How much will it cost? Well, he, yeah, Don Sun will have to go all in. Uh, so, but, but he's a great programmer, so he was able to. It was a the kind of scale of project where one really good programmer could actually make a huge difference. How long will it take? Well, he managed to do the, the first system in less than a year. Finally, what are the midterm and final exams to check? Um, well, you could say basic system bootstrapping itself, um, and then to check for success, uh, make, a, make a download. And he, he did that. He had made a free download um, and got you know, a bunch of customers in the, the sort of technical sector um, using it. Um, and that, in the end, was enough to convince the product team after a while to actually take these things on board. OK, so that, I'm just going through those different questions and making them specific in the case of one particular um, project. Um, Sorry. What? Yeah. Sorry, I just have a question. Um, the, the term uh, elevator pitch com comes to mind, because some of the questions uh, uh, are, are those you want to deliver for an elevator pitch. Have you heard about elevator pitches that you sell your research in the duration of an elevator ride to someone who's not familiar with the research area? Um, we in, in Microsoft Research, that's an important thing for us that we, you know, that people that what, what you do, you can explain it uh, and convincingly um, the value of it uh, in like a minute or so. Um, so I, I think the first first four certainly match those. Have you? Any guidelines here for the students, perhaps? Yes, that's always a good idea. I mean, when you're, when you're at conferences, uh, you should you know, have a few sentences prepared for when you meet senior people. In fact, firstly, you should seek out senior people so you do meet them. That's your job at a conference to get yourself noticed. And then don't ask them about the weather or something um, or what, what they've done on a holiday around about the conference. Ask, or tell them what you're doing and ask them for, the, for your feedback. So you should, you should always have a, you know, a few sentences, uh, generally speaking, answering the first couple of questions there about what you're trying to do uh, and, and why it's better than the competition. So yeah, that's a good point. point yeah, Scarlett. I think that'd be useful for your poster sessions as well. If you just have you know, a bit of a pitch about what your, what your poster is about rather than expecting everyone to kind of drill into all the detail on your, on your poster. OK, so let me move on again. <coughs> more, more strategy. So seek criticism. Uh, 
it, it's, uh, when I was a PhD student, I was quite shy, uh, but I did try and put myself forward. Uh, you know, it's a bit painful putting your ideas out in public um, to start off with, but at all levels of being a researcher, it's really important to do this because you get, you get feedback and so you can adjust your, your course and ultimately save time. You know, there's a, there's a temptation to sort of delay until something is perfect. I, I, generally, that's a bad idea because nothing ever really becomes perfect. Um, so, and, and writing proposals. Uh, this is something you have to do once you graduate from your, your degree. Uh, and to some degree, you do this as you write your first year report. You're proposing what to do in the next few years. People grumble about proposals, but actually they're a good thing because they help you decide what you're trying to do uh, and to talk about how you're going to uh, have an impact. Um, and I mean, this is John Wheeler, this guy, and he was a, a great American physicist who gave black holes their name and did many other things. And uh, you know, he was saying the fundamental problem is to make the mistakes as fast as possible. So people at all levels you know, make mistakes, and the thing is to make the mistakes faster rather than wasting time. Reviews, uh, so this is like on paper, you know, re reviews you get back from papers, uh, re reviews you get on your first year report, uh, reviews you get about um, project proposals. Uh, it's, it's so easy to fool yourself. You've got lots of biases, you love your ideas. It's really good to get it out there. Your, your peers are gonna be much more skeptical. Uh, and, and failures are good. Uh, you know, you can just, I, I mean, you, you almost always learn from your failures and, and that leads to better projects. Uh, and uh, we, we, so this is Roger Needham, who was the founder of our lab. And this, of course, is Gates, who visited, about, this is about 10, 12 years ago when he visited uh, Cambridge. And, and Gates, uh, when, when he employed Roger back in 97, uh, told him, if all your researchers' projects succeed, then you have failed. So there's a lovely kind of uh, sort of recursiveness in that. That what he's saying is that if, if your folks are all just going out and they're always coming back saying, oh, this is a great paper, we finished this off, fantastic, and, and never kind of admit that things went wrong, then it means that Roger had not encouraged us to, to, to take big enough risks uh, and, and th that might fail. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, you shouldn't be scared of, of, you know, making a fool of yourself. You know, go for big things. Uh, okay, and don't be seduced by proxies. Uh, you should decide what it is you want to do, like I've been saying, in, in technical terms. There's a particular audience you're trying to reach. You know, you're trying to get people to use a programming language, trying to come up with a much better computer vision system, whatever, these kind of technical aims. Now, we often list uh, things like numbers of papers in conferences, numbers of program committees we've got, citations, number of downloads as sort of intermediate sort of proxies for success, but they are not the same thing as success. So don't try and maximize those. I mean, I guess you need respectable numbers because there's always a certain amount of management accounting going on, you know, whoever you work for. But really, you shouldn't be maximizing those. You know, try and do fewer things and, and do them great. We're strongly encouraged here not to maximize the number of papers we publish, but instead to target you know, high quality competitive venues uh, with really high quality papers. Uh, working in collaboration, I've got a few uh, points about that, the, the good things and the bad things. Individual versus group work. This is Dijkstra, one of the greats of uh, programming language semantics. Um, and he said, only do what only you can do. So, you know, none of us has, a skill, has all the skill sets right across computer science. You know, for example, some of us are better at theory and some of us are better at practice. So for many projects, uh, it's a good idea to collaborate. Uh, and, and then together you can make a much, you know, better, better project. Um, beware the pigs and chickens problem. So this is a slogan that goes back to Xerox Park. Uh, so it's about, the, you know, the analogy, it's about, it's an analogy for a research project. But the analogy is your, your breakfast plate, where you've got bacon and eggs. Uh, so the, the idea is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the chicken has contributed to the breakfast, but the pig was fully committed. So you've got to watch for that in collaborations, that there may be a few people who are fully committed to pigs, but there may be some chickens who might even be wasting your time, who are kind of tagging along to meetings, but are not actually generating any ideas. So that's something to watch for. Um, there's then questions about within a discipline versus across disciplines. So this is Walter Scott, great Scottish 19th century novelist and playwright. And he had this saying that one half the world thinks the other daft. You know, like the theorists think the, think the practitioners are daft. Um, so we have different value systems. You know, one person's rigor is another person's uh, pedantry. Uh, so that's a kind of difficulty that you can have with uh, uh, cross-disciplinary work. 
Uh, so, you know, I collaborate with machine learning folks, and I'm a PL person, and I think they sometimes think I'm a bit pedantic, whereas uh, I think they're a little bit unrigorous, frankly. <laughs> so, you know, that's a little interesting tension we have in the collaboration that you need, you need to watch. Uh, the, another one is subjects of convenience for administrators. And this is particularly true, say, the topic of machine learning, you know, which is a core part of uh, informatics. Uh, but machine learning is scattered across university departments. You know, there's physics, there's like uh, chemist, statistical chemistry, there's statistics, uh, then there's computer science, uh, lots of different subject departments that uh, all are doing machine learning and have got different jargon, but they're doing the same sort of thing. So that's been a problem for machine learning. It's been quite sort of fragmented. And they're kind of coming together, uh, but that has been a problem. So we should try and you know, ignore uh, subject boundaries. It's just, it's just science. At the same time, I'd say, wait until you finish your PhD. Now is not the time for you guys to try and kind of uh, you know, cross those boundaries. I'd say, you know, work with your, your advisor, work closely with them, take their advice, uh, and finish your PhD. And you can be more adventurous once you've got a more stable uh, position. Uh, and if you do have a collaboration, only have one step specialist participant, or else they'll spend all the time arguing about the best way to do something. Whereas if there's, say, one machine learning person, one you know, programming language person, we can just get on with it. And it's easy to, to know who is the expert on a particular notation um, or whatever. I've uh, a note or two for theorists. Um, Actually, and practitioners. So this is uh, Robert Milner, a great theorist, and personally hugely influential on in me. Uh, and he's the 1991 uh, Turing Award winner. And he did some amazing stuff in programming languages, functional programming, in, in concurrency theory, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and he established a lab called the uh, Laboratory for Foundations of Computer Science in Edinburgh. And his big goal for that was his double thesis, that the design of computing systems can only properly succeed if it's well-grounded in theory and that the important concepts in the theory can only emerge through protracted exposure to application. And I found that thesis very useful in my own work. And I, can, I mean, so I took one of his series called the Pi Calculus and uh, figured out how to apply uh, you know, an application of it in the area of security protocols, which was just a different thing that, say, Robin had never heard of. So I made this connection. It was part of the adjacent possible a little combination I could make. It wasn't a particular eureka moment. It was just a combination of things that were there on the table within the computer lab. Where, there were, where I was at Cambridge, where there were people doing pi calculus, and then in a completely different seminar series, people talking about security protocols, and I had this idea where I could combine the two, which has proved very, very useful for me. Uh, it's probably my most cited paper. Uh, so that, that was a, an example of like, following this advice of like, trying to evaluate the theory in, in practice. Um, so as it is generally, if you're doing theory, this is great. You know, I, I guess the value system there very much is uh, mathematical, like develop a body of knowledge encoded in a body of theorems, brilliant. But I'd say also uh, consider how you can apply your theories in practice and look for applications. And who knows, you might find something amazing. Uh, this is another argument that Robin has for uh, experimentation. And, and this is very much what he did. You know, he, he built... Uh, he built various theorem-proving systems back in the, in the 70s. So LCF was one of them, and it, it, it led to a series of innovations. So he developed LCF, and which led to the ML programming language back in the 70s. So he was a real pioneer of functional programming, and then led to things like OCaml and Haskell and F-sharp. So it eventually became super widely deployed because he actually tried to sort of test his theories in practice. OK, shifting gears again, you see, I, I think we can learn from a lot of uh, different areas as we, we, as we do, do research and, and choose strategies. And it's five minutes before we get onto the homework. So let me say, so this is Eric Ries. And he has a book called The Lean Startup, which is fab. It's become very popular in the last few years. Um, and and he, his theory uh, is that, uh, well, firstly, a startup is an organization to create products under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And that his theory is that, uh, the, that learning is the essential unit of progress uh, for startups. So when I read his book, I thought, wow, this is like being a researcher. You know, learning is the essential unit of progress for researchers, too. So I'd recommend go reading his book. Now, it's not applicable to everything. I don't know whether it's applicable to mathematics. But I think it's a, you know, these kind of ideas are very applicable in, uh, uh, when we're building computer technologies. Because, of course, that's not so far from being a, a startup. Um, Easy to kid yourself about what customers want. You know, get feedback. It's kind of what I've been saying. You should give seminars to get feedback. He's saying a startup, it's essential for a startup to get feedback from 
uh, customers because it's so uncertain what is actually going to be useful. Uh, and here's this idea of validated learning, where you systematically set up experiments and get empirical data from real customers. And to do that, here's this idea of a minimal viable product, where you build a sort of tiny version, lightly engineered, of the product you want to build that's just good enough. So you put just enough effort into it and no more that it's good enough to put it out in front of customers to get their feedback. Um, and he wants to enable this build, measure, learn loop. And the, the thing, right, the examples I want to give are firstly, this minimal viable product could just be a video. So Dropbox is hugely successful. Many of you guys might use Dropbox. Dropbox originally put out their product as a video. They wanted to figure out what sort of user experience would actually attract customers, and they didn't know, so they mocked something up, put a video out, and discovered that lots of people wanted it because they, they put a video out and they had a sort of email address where you could sign up if you wanted to get to learn more, and lots of people signed up. So that convinced them that it was worth pushing what ended up being a hugely successful uh, product. There's the, I'm sorry, there's the concierge idea. This was uh, a company called Food on the Table, uh, and they, they, they wanted to build a website that would help people uh, produce menus for the week that could be sourced with local ingredients from supermarkets and local stores in the vicinity. And they weren't sure whether this was going to work or not. They were going to build a website to do that. So what the, start, what the CEO did was he, he pretended he was the website. So he managed to find one person who would sign up for the service. And he went and sat down with, with them in their kitchen and acted as if he was the website, asked them questions, and figured out you know, what, how they would like to plan their, their, uh, their, their menu. And he did that repeatedly until he got an idea of what sort of would work. And then they built some software to do it and became a success. And then there's the Wizard of Oz idea, which is a little similar, but where you build what appears to be a website that works. And there was a company called Aardvark that did this. They wanted to have a general question answering uh, system for the web. And they built it with humans in the back end. So the idea was it was that you could type in an arbitrary question you wanted, hit return, and it would sort of say, just computing. And in the background, there were real people sort of looking at Wikipedia or whatever, and then typing the answers back. And they were trying to figure out what sort of what would work. Um, and they figured they could automate some of the stuff, but they wanted to figure out what would work first. So that's what they did. So I highly recommend reading this book. It's, I think it will maybe change the way you think about research, and maybe it should turn you into, into an entrepreneur. Um, OK, I'm two minutes to homework. Let me go through this very quickly. Work with the system. There's a system. And it has lots of resources. So this is Clay Shirky. Uh, and he's the, uh, uh, you know, he's a media theorist. Uh, uh, and here's this idea of cognitive surplus. That there's a lot of humans who've got time <coughs> in their hands who contribute to open source projects. So if you're going to find a way to, to make your research benefit from that, like making a download, make your code available, then that can really help your research. If you fight, there's a system. If you fight it, pick your ba battles carefully. Uh, you know, so a lot of scientists are stubborn folks, and they get, they get embroiled in silly arguments about whether it's a blackboard or a whiteboard, for example. You know, and they say chalk is much better, and waste time. There's only, you have only so much time. It's precious. Devote your time to science, not sort of messing with the system. And finally, I've got to put this up. This is the young Andy. This is just after I finished my PhD. And I invited myself places. So it's kind of amazing that uh, universities in the States, in particular, have got lots of money for visiting speakers. And someone told me, just ask yourself, you know, I had a paper in Boston, and the university was flying me there. And so I emailed someone at Yale, and someone, uh, someone in DC, and Chicago, and so forth, and said, hi, I'm Andy Gordon. I've got this talk I can give, and there's another talk I can give. Can I visit? And they had money. So they said, sure. And they put me up in the hotel. They, they paid for my flights internally. And hey, they even gave me money. They gave me an honorarium. They paid me $150 to give a talk, which is more than Scarlett's done, in <laughs> fact. Uh, so it's, it, I, I highly recommend this. Just try it. If you're going to a country and someone's paying you to go there, look at the universities that are within reach and invite yourself. The worst that can happen is they don't reply. Put yourself forward. OK, um, I am going to move on to, I'm going to move on to, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of slides uh, to get onto the homework. Uh, this slide is, was, was about maintaining balance, which is very important. Uh, and you know, get some exercise, get out of the lab. It's very easy. In, in, you know, we're, we're very kind of intense, committed people. And we sometimes let our bodies uh, <laughs> go, you know, go to waste uh, 
you know, so it's really important to get exercise. So I, I'd highly recommend uh, this, this woman uh, is Kathleen Fisher, uh, who has got a great deck uh, about finding balance in computer science. So, and I, I can't do justice, it, justice to it. So highly recommend following this URL and reading her uh, uh, talk about maintain, maintaining balance in research. Uh, by the way, um, most of the, the slide decks will be available online unless there's something critical in them. Okay, and uh, I'll also skip over this quickly, but I check out this guy, this is called Matt Might, uh, and he's got a great set of pages giving very useful advice, I think, for grad students and for researchers. And this idea is fantastic, he has 12 resolutions for grad students, so the idea is do one of these a month over the calendar year. And they're all pretty simple things you can do, but his point is that you tend to forget to do these things because you get engrossed in the, in the, the here and the now. So go check out his website. There's, uh, and he, he elaborates on all of these points. Uh, the one thing I would say, keep an eye on the job market, that's December. That's the time to think about coming for an internship at MSR Cambridge, because our deadline is usually about February uh, or end of January. So invite yourself to, to be an intern uh, at, MR, at MSR Cambridge. Okay, homework. Your Cambridge homework. So, uh, there's two hallmarks, and they're both about boundaries. So I got this image. This is to try and help you remember. It's a fence in Cambridge, or a, a nice yeah, fence. Uh, so the first hallmark is actually is about work-life balance, is, is um, get your email, manage your email time better. Uh, we allow email to distract us a lot, uh, you know, to sit festering in our inboxes, uh, to, to slow us down. Uh, so. You could read up about how to manage email better. This is an exercise you could do. You know, it's just a couple of hours. Search the web about it. Uh, some specific things are this delete, delegate, do, defer uh, advice, which to manage your email within, say, two minutes. Uh, just decide to delete it. Ask someone else to do it. Maybe it's something you can do within two minutes. Just do it. Or plan. If it's, so it's something you need to do. You can't delegate it. Defer it to, to, to happen some other time. Switch off notifications. They're incredibly distracting and futile, just switch it off. You should check email once a day, or I uh, don't know if anyone can ever do that, but not, not when it comes in. It's, it's, it's just, it just kills your productivity to have these you know, pop-ups. Just switch them all off. I've had mine switched off for years. Don't do email at weekends. That's pretty tough. Okay, don't send email at weekends. <laughs> or do it for a month, try it. The point is that you choose your boundary, right? Uh, I, I see people, at, I see people in, in this lab and in universities who have got no boundaries at all. Heads of departments sending emails at 9 in the morning on Sundays. It, they give the impression, possibly correctly, that they're spending all the time working. Uh, this is, in my humble opinion, unhealthy, and it's also ultimately unproductive, that you're tired and you're not going to be as creative if you're working all the time. So the, the point of the exercise is to do that, but the higher point I'd like you to, to take away is that you are choosing a boundary that you're setting. You're saying, okay, for the next month, I'm not going to send email at weekends. Try it for a month. I, I believe you will find that you are empowered. Maybe you don't believe me, but you're empowered to set other boundaries if you, if you actually try that. The second exercise is, again, about boundaries. Organize a speed dating society. I personally have found this very useful. It's fun to do. Uh, you, you may forge, you will forge new connections. What I suggest, go back to your university department, find out a grad student who's in a different subject area than you, but who you get on with, and uh, plan to have a speed dating society of the sort I've spoken about, you know, research speed dating society, get people together. It's really easy. I mean, it's a sort of two-hour session. You could organize it on a Friday afternoon. Uh, you know, maybe get everyone to say a little bit about themselves, first of all, to the whole group, maybe a minute each, and then, you know, uh, find a way to assign people partners, you know, to have their five speed dates of five minutes each, something like that. Uh, and uh, you'll be helping to, you know, foster interconnectedness to make the adjacent possible more likely to be discovered uh, by researchers. Um, the other point, though, the bigger point, again, is about boundaries, that it's you taking a professional initiative. I mean, you folks are all fairly junior. I think you're about one year into your PhD. You, you're kind of at the bottom of the food chain, academically speaking. Well, food chain's the wrong word, but you're at the bottom of the pyramid, ac academically speak speaking. And the thing is, you guys, you are the researchers of the future. You know, the only thing that's holding you back from doing things like this, from organizing conferences, and et cetera, is that you have this belief that you're too junior, I would say. Probably most of you feel that way. And I would say to you, you're not too junior. 
You know, now is a good time to start organizing things. And this is something you can do in your department, right? You don't have to do this internationally or anything like that. It's just something you can do locally. The folks in your department will love it. Your supervisor will love it that you're taking an initiative to do something like this in your department. OK, so I'd suggest you do that. You, you're crossing a boundary. And what I'd ask you to do is please send me email. Right? I'm adg at microsoft.com. I'm Andy Gordon. You can find me on the web, adg at microsoft.com. What I suggest you do, if you like this, you know, now or later today, send me an email and say, hi, I'm you know, whoever you are. Uh, tell me what your university is. And said, I'm, I'm going to organize a speed dating society. OK, and uh, I'll get back to you if you haven't. I'm serious. You're looking kind of dubious. Try is anyone dubious? Will you do it? Will someone do it? Come on, speak up. So we already have such a thing. It's only we call it the Arctic Interactions. OK, and who organizes it? Um, some, some postdoc in our department. OK, grad students could organize it in a department. So OK, fine. So it's already happening. But, if you're, but even if you think something like this is already happening, um, you, you could still organize it. OK, fantastic. Yeah, was awesome. Really what was your experience? Yeah, it was really good. It helps if you've got a lot of wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have that at the start as well. Uh, we had a little talk by uh, some professor uh, who just kind of, I guess, spoke about his experience of interacting with other people during his research. But the whole point was it was for people across a huge range of disciplines. And the whole point was to kind of promote the idea of working across academic boundaries. Um, and then. It helps if you've got like a funny noise to encourage people to move to the next person. <laughs> so we started with a foghorn, but then we changed it to a Tibetan gong because that was a little bit more peaceful. Um, and apart from that, I think uh, it was good. Like I met, we met two or three people that we, you know that we thought we might try and work with, and then a few of those kind of petered out. But there's still contacts that we have. That was people from our group. Um, but I think it's a really good idea. Uh, and it's, and it's very easy to do. I think you don't even need the talk at the start. You can just have some wine and, and, uh, and get people moving on quite quickly. And yeah, it's good fun. Brilliant. You've heard the guy. Uh, so you know, send me a mail. OK, that's the end. Here's a summary. Uh, it'll be on the web. Thanks so much for your attention.